then. Two key questions. Yeah. Because the university, has the university relied on the city of Detroit and Detroit public schools so heavily as feeder schools that one outreach to DPSCP as schools and schools in the region and quite frankly African American students from around the country that, that Wayne leaned so heavily on recruiting from Detroit public schools when that was not there, the numbers totally, uh, you know, became an issue. And why aren't they able to get in? <clears throat> well, I would suspect, <clears throat> excuse me, I would suspect that they, um, that they, they're not enrolled because they uh, can't meet the criteria that we have that was an increased criteria, admissions criteria. So I'll say something about that in that, you know, it, it's more than just, you know, holding President Wilson to account and complaining about, you know, his shortcomings here and here and here. Right. What happens is you need to have solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So so we've offered up solutions to some of these problems, especially like our, in our enrollment area regarding, mm -hmm. well, we increased the SAT, ACT score. You have to have a certain score to get in, right, along with your grade point. Well. I remember when I, you know, when I took the um, SAT, or I, I took the ACT, actually, way long, long ago, decades ago, right? You, you get the test one time for free at your public school, and my family was, you know, we couldn't afford to send me to a class to learn how to take the test, and, mm -hmm. and we sure as heck couldn't afford to let me retake until I got a better score, and, you know? And, and I just was, I was a good student, but I, I did horribly on this test. And, it, and data shows that historically underrepresented students, black, brown, poor, white, don't tend to not do well on standardized tests. Yeah. So we put, higher ed as a whole, um, put so much emphasis on these scores. And, and, and all it really is is picking who's going to win and who's going to lose. Right. And, and we and don't think it's indicative of that. From the, <clears throat> from the federal charges just recently, even if you're black and brown and you don't have the money, you even have in some affluent fa families where they'll create that their kid was on a yacht team and that's how yes. they ended up getting into the college. Exactly. I right. have to just say that as a footnote. Right. Uh, where, where we know that testing across the board can be a challenge. But let me ask you about the program uh, about a year ago, which when the big press release about this particular initiative with Detroit Public Schools was announced. It took me back just a little bit, and I researched it quite a bit, uh, where Detroit Public Schools would have uh, the opportunity to get tuition free to Wayne State University through the Rise Me program, uh, right? And uh, this was an initiative uh, that was kicked off by the mayor, the governor, some of the board of governors, that would give the graduates from Detroit Public School uh, automatic acceptance into Wayne State University called the Heart of Detroit Tuition Pledge. That was maybe, COVID has got me confused. That was maybe over a year or so ago where students who would have enrolled in fall 2020 would have had an opportunity to be a part of this Heart of Detroit uh, tuition pledge. Yeah. Were you in agreement with that? Were you were you a part of that? Was this a board of governors initiative? Was this the Dr. Wilson initiative? And how effective has that been? Because one of the tenets of this, uh, when you talk about they can't they can't pass the test or the ACT and AC, the SAT and ACT scores, this initiative was supposed to be the initiative to get them in. My challenge to this initiative was, when I looked at the Rise Me, the way in which it was designed, most students, whether you were in the city of Detroit or in the region, would not have been able to get in. Yeah. So, so is that initiative, is it effective? Is it, how is it not working when it's something that came, that, that the president came up with? And let me just say as a footnote, everybody who wants to respond, I'm gonna to get to your questions coming up in just a few minutes, but I just got to get in as much as I can while we have the governor with us. Go right ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. No, thank you for that. And thanks for asking about that program. It's called the Heart of Detroit Pledge. And um, it was um, announced with a lot of fanfare. Like you said, the, you know, the, the President Wilson was there, the Mayor of Detroit was there, the Governor was there, mm -hmm. and uh, it was in a, you know, at a high school with a bunch of students there and everybody had their little t-shirts on. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but who didn't know and who, who wasn't there was the board. 
Okay, mm -hmm. we didn't, we, uh, there was one board member there who was my former colleague, Kim Trent, uh, who's no longer on the Board of Governors, but she was the board chair last year, so she was at the event. Um, we were not informed. I found out from a girlfriend that there was going to be a press conference that morning, like an hour and a half before the press conference. I found out that they were going to do this big, this big, you know, new policy, right? Here's what we're going to do. Here's, you know. And um, the, the, the governing board was not made aware until I, ta until I called our board secretary and said, hey, is something going on today? And uh, we were told, you know, oh, yeah, they're going to have, you know, I thought so-and-so told you. No, nobody told us. And nobody brought the program to us so that it could be vetted and approved, right? Okay. Because it's going to cost money to do the program, but where's the money coming from if the board hasn't approved what the program is? and the funding that's supposed to go to support it, right? So the so, net to that is nothing has happened with that program. I we think, should have addressed the issue of yeah. Detroit Public School students having access to Wayne State. Right. Well, it, it, and I think it was more of a um, marketing gimmick than oh, it wow. was anything else. Um, it really, I mean, if you look, I had seen an article from MLive that they had done, a really good article from MLive that basically called it it, you know, this was a marketing gimmick, and if you look at the, you know, the criteria that you have to meet, kids from Bloomfield Hills and these, you know, higher upper upper echelon schools aren't going to be able to get in, mm -hmm. so uh, or jump through the hoops that need to be, you know, that need to be jumped through in order to mm -hmm. be part of the program. But the other thing is that had they had the president brought this to the board, we could have answered all these questions and said, hey, look. Yeah, that's what vetting and passing things by us means, right? Include include us. This is what shared governance means. You have to bring stuff to us so that we can look at it, see if there's any questions, find out any um, difficulties or holes in it that we could fill and correct before you present it to the public, right? So this went off without any of that happening. And and not, not just that, but the added, you, we, we weren't invited to the event, we didn't know about the event, you know, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, and then it, it makes it suspect for people to say, well, why would you, you know, did you just, you just need a good marketing day that day or a good press day? Because it got nationwide appeal and it got nationwide attention that day um, until, you know, people like Lot Michigan Live and Bridge, Mag or Bridge Michigan did, you know, wrote articles to say, ah, oh, this looks a little suspect, you know? Yeah. So, so to your knowledge, my guest is Sandra Hughes O'Brien, uh, uh, governor, one of the board of governors at Wayne State University, and it's a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, candid conversation. And again, uh, Governor, I thank you for joining me. So, to your knowledge, uh, based on that program um, and looking at the numbers, uh, <coughs> that program in the year it has been in effect, it should have affected the fall 2020, has been ineffective. Is that? Can I make that assumption? So we don't know if it's been ineffective because we've not gotten any reporting to say we, we admitted four students or, okay. you know, two students came or two students were eligible. We've got no data regarding how many students were admitted under that program um, or qualified for the program. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the administration puts out, well, you know, this is, we're doing really well with the Heart of Detroit Pledge, but they're not telling their board you know, you can say that, but without data. I mean, we're you know we're educators. We, I'm a lawyer by trade. I you know I want facts. Mm -hmm. So without facts and data, all we have is their word. And and you know you know that with a you know a dollar would get you a cup of coffee. You know. Okay. All right. B Huff three. Thank you. And I'm taking your questions and comments. He asked the question, Governor. Has he? And I'm he's referring to uh, Dr. Wilson. Okay. Ever even tried to meet DPS students in their own schools? to create a relationship and inspire them to apply one day. To your knowledge, can you respond to that? Uh, yeah, that? thanks for the question and the answer is no. So um, we have not, and uh, not he directly, uh, nor the institution as a whole has made any meaningful overtures to the Detroit Public School Systems to, you know, to develop programming or have some collaboration at the, you know, at the lower level, uh, elementary school level, the secondary level, uh, I mean, it could help those students and help the Detroit public school system, but it also could help develop a pipeline of students for us, right, who, who want to come to the university and, right. and, and be knowing about it and be comfortable with the university from a very young age. But my understanding, I sit on a board, I sit in a uh, bilingual parent advisory board for the Detroit public school 
of um, community district. And one of the things that I was told is that uh, when they found out I was on $40 at Wayne, they said, you know, you guys aren't calling us. Mm. You don't mm -hmm. call us. Who calls us is U of M. And in our room. <laughs> Except we're right here in your backyard. Right. We should be, you know, we're your institution. We right. need to be there for you. And right. we just, and we just aren't. And because so, I can tell you, my, you know, <clears throat> and, and I don't want to make this, only because I've been over the last seven years in the circle of friends who have selective colleges. Okay. So, yeah. and I'm not asking necessarily as a, 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 a governor uh, with Wayne, but you know, a lot of students want to get away to go to college. Right. They just do. So, so I remember Governor Granholm's um, uh, Cool Cities kind of initiative, and yeah. she talked about uh, at that time uh, how the state of Michigan, the region, city of Detroit, produced some incredible students. However, they choose to go away yeah. to college and they never come back. Yeah. And they take the great foundation of many of them, their public education uh, across the state, and we're specifically talking about Detroit and the region because DPS, CPS has a wonderful group of students who graduate and can compete academically at Wayne. Yeah. Um, so as I talk to a couple of those young people I know and as some of them I know have selected schools. Um, one, those who are academically prepared in and outside the city of Detroit, who choose to go to other schools and are ready uh, and can do the work, uh, are not choosing Wayne State. The question becomes, well, why? And when you look at competing in terms of scholarships, and you mentioned some of the feeder schools, those feeder schools where the students in Detroit Public Schools Community District, they're getting offered incredible financial opportunities to attend schools outside of the city of Detroit or the state of Michigan. Yeah. So Wayne State is also dealing with, if you want the better students to be able to come to Wayne, you've got to let, you've got to compete. And you mentioned University of Michigan, and let's not even talk about some of the schools, you know, so a parent is saying, it's costing two hundred thousand dollars to get a four year education at the top notch schools. Mm -hmm. Wayne is offering me zero, except that it's in my backyard. Right. And XYZ University is offering me a full ride plus graduate school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're right. And 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 I'm not saying nor have we ever said that every black student in the city has to come to Wayne. I sure would love it but if they why did. do why do the best mm -hmm. of the best students from the yeah. city of Detroit go mm -hmm. somewhere other than Wayne, do you think? And, are, and is Wayne offering to those students financial assistance other than Pell Grant right. to be able to attend when they're getting scholarship offers to competing universities in the region or around the country? Yeah, I don't think we are giving students scholarships to the extent that, uh, you know, like a, a maybe an HBCU or historically black college and, and, or U of M. I mean, these people are very, U of M and uh, Michigan State, some of the other Big Ten schools around the country. They are they aggressively go after and have the money to pay mm -hmm. to woo a child to come to your school, right? Mm -hmm. We will give you a good education. You're going to have U of M on your resume for your whole life. We're going to have you know we're going to support you here. We're going to do all these things, and I think that that you know um, is one of the reasons why we don't do enough in the scholarship area mm -hmm. to to um, entice a, a student to want to stay and go to school in right. the city. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I just, I think that that's one of the, I mean, I think that's one of our, another one of our shortcomings. I'm not saying every student has to come here that we're supposed to have, you know, more uh, 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 just Detroit black students here. That's not true. Right. But I sh wouldn't we want to have them? Of course. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, Dr. Wilson has said just because we're, just because we're in the blackest city in America doesn't mean we have to, you know, our, our student body has to mimic the community. It, well, you know, I don't know that I agree with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Wouldn't we want it to mimic the community? Yes, of course. We would want right. our faculty to mimic the community, and we want we would want more faculty of color so that our stu you know to make our students comfortable in knowing I'm being taught by people who look like me. Right, right, right. So let's let, let's let's go back mm -hmm. for a second um, in recruitment of students and educators. How do you respond in terms of professors in the classroom? Uh, my question is your thought on the representation of uh, professors of color. How is Wayne State doing in that area? Okay. 
Oh. <laughs> um, uh, well, we're not doing very well at all. And so, and, and I guess so the best way to say it is that um, our, our university's fact books, F-A-C-T, fact books, it's the data every collected every year, demographics uh, for everything that are done on an annual basis for everything from, from research to our student body to the faculty, everything. Well, when, when President Wilson came here, his first year here, we stopped um, including the diversity of our faculty staff and um, in terms of numbers. And I suspect it was because, you know, we had, that was 20, 20, uh, 12, 2013. So the, that year of those fact books, which you, which you can find on our website, wayne.edu, just look in fact book. Look at the one from 2011 to 2012, and you'll see the data regarding our full-time faculty. And our full-time faculty of color was about 109. It was 6% black, 2% brown. That meant 116, 116 black full-time faculty and 37 Latino. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, out of mm -hmm. almost you know over 2,000, right? Really bad really bad and so we don't report those anymore that was the last time we've heard about that mm -hmm. I suspect because we haven't in you know years 13 14 15 16 all the way to this year um is because the numbers aren't much better mm -hmm. i mean I, I, that's a complaint that i have from black and brown students who come to me and say hey you know there's nobody that looks like me here and who do i go to there's one woman and everybody goes to her and you know she's trying to make tenure and do all this other stuff in her career and but wants to help us and then it you know holds that person back. It's 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 uh, we need more black and brown faculty. That's so, it. So so Governor O'Brien, um, mm -hmm. we 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 read the reports. We've seen the reports. Taking all of your questions coming up in just just a little bit. I want to get to slides as well. She said, and why is that? Yeah. But there there appears to be uh, a division within the board of Gov governors yeah. right now, yeah. uh, and as it relates to uh, Dr. Wilson. Um, in, in, from your vantage point, what are the challenges uh, and how can the university grow when there are some challenges within the Board of Governors that believes that they have a president, some that may feel he should stay, and some that feel maybe that time has come due, and it's due time, um, that this is what, in this, this time right now, where there should be a collective with the administration and the Board of Governors uh, uh, collectively coming together to recruit and put Wayne in the best possible situation it can. Um, so explain that division uh, from your perspective and what needs to happen, in your opinion, moving forward uh, to put Wayne in the best possible situation to address their issues with recruiting students of color, specifically African American students, and two, uh, graduating those students and dealing with those issues for, for people of color at Wayne State University. So um, you're right that the board is split. We have a, a, the Michigan Constitution, um, uh, you know, sets forth that we are an eight-person elected partisan governing board. Uh, that is elected statewide, we serve without pay. So I'm a lawyer by trade, right? So I'm keeping my day job while I, while I have a second full-time job as a public servant tending to the you know, business of Wayne State. So there's eight-person board, um, and I'm not sure what they were thinking in the 60s when, they, when, when the you know, constitutional framers of the legislature did this, but meaning an no, even number, meaning an even number. Yeah, making an even number, right? Instead of like an odd number where you you wouldn't ever have a you know a deadlock. Right. So currently, uh, four board members have called for the president firing, and um, and then four are are standing with the president, supportive of the president. And, and, and what side are you on? If, if I'm I on the have. firing side. I'm on okay. the firing side. Yeah. Okay. And um, I think it's, I mean, and it, and it pains me because I'm the one that brought him here. And so it's, it is, um, it's, it's uh, disappointing to me that I have to be the one that's on, on the side that, you know, needs to tell him, hey, you know, time is due for the good of the institution. You know, you should, you should just move on. Mm -hmm. And, um, but without five votes 
one way or the other, he stays, right? Mm -hmm. so, he, so, so half of the governing board has lost confidence in him. Half of your bosses have lost confidence in you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, the faculty union did a, um, a survey of all the members uh, early in March of this year before COVID. <clears throat> and the results came back 29% approval rating, right? That's yeah. lower than Trump. That's lower than Trump's approval rating. So with a 29% approval rating of your faculty union and half your governing board who has lost confidence in you, um, you would, you know, you would think that he would want to sit down with us and say, hey, look, let's, let's not make this all crazy. Let's, you know, let's do what's right for the students. Let's do what's right for the institution. And, you know, let's find you a graceful way to, to move on to, you know, greener pastures, right? Mm -hmm. but, he, but that's not what's happening. Uh, rather, he rather just doubled down and, um, you know, and attacked the messengers for exposing information that, you know, puts him in a bad light. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's not, as I said, not personal. These are, this is data and these are distinct policy differences that we have with them. And um, until we have a board, um, I'm running for uh, renomination. So the so the governing boards are not nominated by political parties uh, at their conventions. So I'm a Democrat. So I ran with the Dems last in 2012, and I won. And um, so in order to get renominated and to appear on the ballot in November statewide, I have to be nominated by the Democratic Party at our party's convention, which is going to be virtual on um, August 29 and 30 is the convention. But you can vote by email or by telephone for me uh, beginning Friday, August 28 and 29. Mm -hmm. And so the voting will be done by email, but the, but the party membership are the people who vote to place the nominees on the November ballot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, there mm -hmm. are, and I'll tell you, there are three, there are two incumbents and one outsider running for two spots. So there's three of us running for two spots. Okay, and that, that's going to be on the November ballot. Those are the two, at, yeah, the two that are nominated. That yeah, will exactly. Be, okay, okay. We'll be on that. Yeah. And you're one of those people. Yeah. I'm one of the three that's vying for the nomination. To, yep. retain, to retain the seat that you currently have. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, okay. So moving Correct. forward, part Correct. of the I'm sorry, Correct. I don't want to finish your, your thought. Sure. If you didn't get an opportunity to finish it, I'll ask my next question. Oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. I just okay. you know, wanted to say that so, it, it, so it, the, nomination, the nomination comes from the, from the Democratic Party. Okay, so membership. moving forward, so moving forward as it stands right now with a eighth member governing board, uh, eight governors, uh, it's just a split. The only thing yeah. that may show a difference may be what happens after the election in November in terms of who's seated. And let me ask you this, are any of those seats appointed? Yes, so, so um, as I mentioned before, Kim Trent and I were the Democratic ticket in 2012. Okay. So we ran together. Kim okay. left the board last year and uh, at the end of her seventh year of our eight year term. Mm -hmm. So then um, uh, Governor Whitmer appointed Shirley Stancato okay. to, to serve. And so Shirley is the only appointed. Everybody else is elected. Okay. And so okay. Shirley is appointed to serve this last year. Tenure? She's keep finishing out yeah. Kim Trent's term. So yeah. is, will her name have to be renominated now for the November election? Yes. Yeah. Is that how yeah. it works? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So she and I and one other woman are vying for the party's nomination. So there's three of us running for two spots. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And right now, there are three African Americans on the governing board. Yes. Two women and one gentleman. Correct. Correct. Yes. Uh, and uh, Shirley Stancato is one who's finishing out Kim Trent's, the remainder of her eight year term. Uh, that's coming up that, that until you know whatever happens in November or whatever right. happens. Well, she'll serve the we'll November serve. November yeah. before November, right? <clears throat> we serve till the end of the year till December thirty-one. Okay, got it. Okay, so uh, at this point, there's just a stalemate then yeah. until the board at best gets through this nominating process and the election process in November. Is Correct. that what we're saying? Correct. All right. Yep. So what is it that you want to say then, and I'm going to get to some of the, the two questions I think out there. 
Okay. So with that being said, what are some of the things that um, at this point with the temperament of the board uh, and, and, and somewhat a disconnect, at least by 50% of the governing board, with the administration that you want to say that you might need to finish between now and the next eight years? Uh, so what, what because now November, because everybody appears to be just split. So what do you as governing member O'Brien want to say to people who are watching and that are going to be listening and following this later, and I'm sure there's some people on here right now who are under the names of whatever that are paying attention to this conversation that you want them to know as to what you've been doing as a board of governor yeah. and what you intend to do moving forward. Right. So, so one of the very first things that I did on the board um, was to uh, put forth a policy for undocumented students to receive um, in-state tuition. So it was a, a tuition equity policy. Mm -hmm. It's the very first thing I did two months into my tenure. So it was brand new. Everybody else is much more seasoned than me, but I knew as a Latino, you know, I'm going to push forward something that I know the community wants. Not just the Latino community, but you know, Arabic community and folks with right. with um, communities that have a, 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 a tendency to have hot, uh, DACA students, right? Uh, right. Uh, undocumented minors. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so we we I impl I helped usher in, uh, um, usher that uh, policy in. We all voted on it. Um, and it was passed unanimously by the board. So now, if you are undocumented student, you don't have to, you can come to Wayne, you don't get financial aid because undocumented students are here, don't qualify, but you don't have to pay out-of-state tuition to come to Wayne. You can pay in-state tuition sure. because we, we, we changed how we, the criteria for admissions to say, uh, you can prove that you're a resident of Michigan, from a Michigan high school within you know, a period of, you know, Two years ahead of two years before you 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 present yourself, right? Yes. So we changed, we did it, and this was the, it was the right thing to do, and um and that was one of the things that it was one of the very first things I did. The second was that we had um and, and Kim Trent had a big part in this one too, is that there was never an office of diversity and inclusion at the university, mm -hmm. and so we knowing right away, you know, seeing some of the number the count the number counts and the decline in black enrollment even back in 2013. Uh, we needed to have an office of uh, diversity, and so we we pushed to have an office. We opened the inaugural office, and then funded it with money so that the director could do programming and you know do what she needed to do in order to, to you know to move policy. It does no good to create it and then yes. not fund it, right? Right, right. So you got to have money to, in order to do things. So we did that too. And then uh, the other thing is that I'm a huge sports fan. I love sports. I'm a sports junkie. So I love athletics. And where Wayne is Division Two athletics, although, you know, I'd love to see us go Division One. I. I don't know why we don't have Division One football in the city of Detroit. Yeah, I think yeah, it's outrageous. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'd love to push that. That's one of the things I want to do in the coming in my next eight years is go yeah. Division One in athletics. Yeah. And to that point, and to that point, especially with COVID and the NCAA has not made that decision yet. But sports is going to be huge in the stands everywhere once we get back to whatever that new normal is going to be. And right. I can sit less than six feet away from you, so that would be right. interesting to happen. And I'm a sports fan too, so yeah. that would be that would be amazing. Go ahead. Good. Yeah. So, so one of the things with athletics is, um, you know, I one is a great revenue generator. So. Um, you know, maybe not this year for U of M and for you know for the bigs for the Division One, um, but they're not they're not hurting for money like you know like some other institutions that have those with athletic dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we could generate you know with our appropriations being how they were and still ten years we're getting money now that same we were getting ten years ago. So mm -hmm. the state appropriations aren't going to go up anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we need to come up with with uh, you know creative ways to generate revenue besides kids besides raising tuition for students yeah so I think athletics is a good one I think it's a no-brainer and I think we should do it but good. the other one thing that I want to mention real quickly regarding sports is that last year I chaired a, um, com uh, a committee on campus um, that helped make a deal with the Detroit Pistons um, where they are going to purchase our or, um, they're going to buy us a and pay for the building of a new basketball arena 
we're the university's going to own it. We took the bonds out. They're paying us back wow. uh, rent and paying the bonds because their G League, their minor league G League team that they just bought, uh, I think two weeks ago, is going to be playing and housing house there too. You're so right. does a couple things. One, our students not only it's an, it's an advantage for our student athletes who are going to be in the weight room walking around with professional athletes around, right? right? And being exposed right. to professional athletes. But also what, what the Pistons have done is we created a program where they would also take interns from other parts of the university, right? So they're going to take law students in the legal department as interns. They're going to take from the Illich School of Business, um, uh, business students, accountants, you know, from our business school, kinesiologists, right, St kinesiology students. And, and, and so that they're supporting us as a whole, not just student athletes, mm -hmm. all of our students have a benefit and they can be they can find themselves you know over on um you know at, at the Detroit Pistons headquarters which is two blocks away now right. from from campus and um working over there and finding out the business side of athletics and what right. an incentive what an incentive to it's be able to be go awesome. It's now, be so awesome. when we think about when we think about the admissions and the admission uh, process and test scores and the like, and there's some colleges and universities already that use their own litmus test and and or ideology to select students based on a, a number of different things. They yeah. don't use the SAT and the ACT yeah. uh, test as a uh, determining factor as to whether a student should or should not be accepted and some major schools around the country are starting to do that. And, and so my, my question to you is how do you feel about the ACT and the SAT scores being one of the big uh, reasons that some of the students are not getting into Wayne State University? Right, no, I totally agree. I mean, I've been, I've been saying that for years and um, there was an article in, uh, I think, two weeks ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is the definitive you know, journal or periodical for higher education. And it, and it was titled, Stop Affirmative Action for White People. And, and I thought there were two, uh, two professors, researchers from Georgetown and one other gentleman who used to write for the Chronicle of Higher Ed, <clears throat> who all three of them created this story. And I wrote them. And I, they're talking about the same stuff I'm talking about. Let's get rid of the, let's make it te admissions test optional and let's not include your SAT and ACT, mm -hmm. right, which I said before, picks winners and losers. Yes. Yeah. Right? You're not going to get in. You have a good GPA, but what admissions people do is they say, well, a Northfield GPA versus a Detroit GPA, maybe they're not the same, so we're going to go with one versus the other. That's not fair. Right. right? And neither is using SATs and ACTs as a definitive um, source uh, of whether you are going to succeed or at college and succeed in life. I think it's crazy. We should not be using it. And um, and I'll t I will tell you, this year we are not we are going test optional for this year. Mm -hmm. And I've been raising this for the last couple years. But um, somehow our admissions office, you know, thought of it themselves, uh, maybe, you know, subliminally, after I've been talking about it for two years, and, and brought it to us and said, can we go test action? I'm yeah. like, yeah, of course because, we can. Yeah, because, Governor, here's the thing. If, if at some point, when you look at the test, there are those in the past that have had the necessary ACT and SAT score, were mm -hmm. able to get admitted, and couldn't get out. Yeah. So yeah. If, if the ACT and SAT score was the litmus test, to determine whether a student could get into the university, well, there were students who had the necessary ACT and SAT scores, got into a said university, right now we're talking Wayne State, got yeah. in and couldn't get out. Uh, so yeah. you talked about a number as low as, I think it was 11%, 27%, 21, 21%. But as I get ready to wrap up, and I want to give you a chance to close, I'm going to read a few comments, too. Thank everybody for coming to this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, for those students who get in, why can't they get out? So the or answer is simple. Six, nope. six, to, six or yeah. more years to get out. No, no, the answer is super simple, and it's it's that we do not we we do not have good learning communities on campus that help surround kids with support. Okay. Okay. So so, but we we have examples on campus like the athletic division, which is our most di one of our most diverse divisions on campus of, of student athletes. Uh, very diverse. So the athletic division has a learning community 
that that's so what they're that, doing is student athletes. Yes, but I they don't spend a lot of money yes. on it. Yes. Yeah, they don't spend a lot of money on it. But what they do is they use they hire part time PhDs to come surround these kids and say, Hey, look, we got we got study hall today. You have a test tomorrow. Whatever. And and and. They use the and I've seen their budget. They don't have a lot of money. We're not Division One, right? But they have a lot of budget, obviously. But but it works, and I would tell you, it works so well that the that our athletic division is graduating kids at a seventy eight percent rate, whereas everybody else in, on campus is only graduating at fifty percent. And unless you're black, you're graduating at 21%. But so wait a minute. So are, is, 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 do they not have, like, staff meetings? I know. You know, how, I, you know is somebody not having staff meetings? I know. You know what? Hey, this is working for us over here. I know. You know what I mean? When 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 you talk about the data, and I'm the data, what does the piece of paper say? Yeah. One plus one, no matter what language you use, is going to be two. It's not rocket science. 